Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inside Healthcare. We're coming to you from inside the urgency room in Venice Heights. And we're pleased to have with us Dr. Rob Anderson. Thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Thank and you, Jody. And he's the assistant medical director here at the urgency room. So what is the urgency room, and what is it all about? How does it differ from, say, urgent care or an ER? Well, certainly, Jody, we're not an emergency department because patients come to us not by way of ambulance, but typically they drive here, and we're also not attached to a hospital. But we're able to take care of some of the same conditions that you can in an emergency department. For example, patients come into us with abdominal pain, and we can do ultrasounds, CAT scans, determine if they have appendicitis or if their gallbladder is infected. If people come in with chest pain, we can determine if they're having a heart attack. Now, we have some of the medicines that we can give for heart attack, for infections such as pneumonia, or common things like strep throat. If you need to be admitted to the hospital, we can also arrange for direct admission to whatever hospital the patient wants to go to. Thereby, they don't have to wait in an emergency department for hours upon hours at end. And this is one of several locations that you have around the Twin Cities. We do. We have three different locations in Woodbury, Badness Heights here, and then also in Egan. What would be the advantage of coming to an urgency room then? Well, here the at the urgency room, we're able to take care of just about everything that you could in the emergency department if you don't feel that you have to call 911. The advantage of coming here is, on average, our bills are typically 30% less expensive compared to the same concern going to an emergency department. And now we're talking with Dr. Timothy Johnson with the urgency room here at Venice Heights, one of the physicians here. So this is just a typical patient room here. So you see a lot of people coming in with severe headaches, migraines. What's the difference? What causes them? How do you treat them? Boy, um, you know, headaches are something that um, uh, we treat here at the urgency room. And I think there's something that uh, people often don't get very uh, satisfactory treatment for when they go to the clinic or when they go to the emergency room for that matter. Because when they go to the clinic, a lot of times they need IV medicines. They need to have an IV place. They need IV fluids. They also need uh, medicines given to them that a lot of clinics really can't do. So what is causing the migraines and how does some of the IV treatments, how does that help alleviate the, the, the things that they're experiencing, not just headache, they have other symptoms as well. Yeah, so specifically about migraine headaches, what causes migraine headaches is um, a little bit of a mystery. But what we know is it's an interplay between the neurons, the cells within the brain, and the vessels, the vasculature, the vessels that bring oxygen and blood flow to the brain. And those can spasm, open and close, there can be some abnormal um, signaling that goes on with, with the nerve cells or the neurons, and in the end of the day, that ends up being a full-blown migraine. People typically feel those coming on, and if they have medicines that they can kind of uh, cut it off at the pass, they like to do that, but every once in a while they can't, and then all of a sudden, oh no, they're into a full-blown migraine. And it's typically a headache that they feel on one side of their head, it's throbbing, it's exceedingly painful, the light hurts their eyes, they're nauseated, oftentimes they're vomiting and they're miserable. You know, I hear from lots of people that have migraines that they, they have a sensitivity to light, they have other symptoms. What would be some of those common symptoms that you see? So the thing that you're talking about is often called an aura. Uh, and a migraine aura is a sense of scintillations, flashing lights, typically in the periphery of the vision. Uh, what's really funny about that is some people can have a migraine with aura and not even have much of a headache. And conversely, some people can have just a little bit of aura or not much at all, and yet they get their full-blown migraine headache. Uh, and so that's just a feature that kind of, kind of lets us know that that headache that they're having truly is a migraine. And what would be the advantage of coming to the urgency room versus going to an emergency room? Well, the first thing uh, that's an advantage is the weight. Um, right now, sadly, across the country, we have now crossed nationally the four-hour mark. The oh average gosh. weight in an emergency department is four hours and two minutes. Um, the weight in the urgency room uh, is a fraction of that. Um, typically, if it uh, gets as much as even 15 or 20 minutes, um, we are uh, scrambling to get people in and seen immediately. And if uh, they're and suffering from a migraine, they want help as soon as possible. Exactly. And, and then the other thing that's really kind of nice about the facilities here in the urgency room is we have the ability to start uh, an IV and give IV fluids because while these people with migraines are not typically dehydrated necessarily, they need to be hyperhydrated. They need to be, really? they need to be, uh, have a, an, a, a, an excess of fluid. They need to be, their brain needs to be very much hydrated. And that is uh, a big deal in making their migraine go away. That, in addition to that, 
uh, typical IV medicines that we use are specific for migraine headaches and uh, work like magic to help it go away. And these are something that um, can happen at any age, any time, migraines? Migraines typically run in families and for reasons that we don't understand tend to affect females a little bit more than males. Um, uh, and, and what we know is that there's triggers for migraines that can make them worse. We know that, um, uh, for example, uh, some, types of some types of alcohol, typically red wine, for example, um, tyramine-containing foods, some kinds of cheeses and salamis, things like that can make migraine headaches come on as a trigger. Um, uh, stress, to a certain extent, can make migraine headaches come on as a, tr as a trigger. And so there's a lot of things that can kind of cause them. But uh, the sad truth is that a lot of people with migraine headaches suffer from migraines for their entire life. And so um, mm -hmm. when they feel it coming on, they're kind of thinking, oh, no, here it goes again. And all they want is relief, and they want it now. You know, at this time of the year, too, we're starting to turn our heat on. Some people use a space heater, fireplaces, things like that, which also increases the risk of seal poisoning, and which is something that you see in the urgency room as well. I am so glad you brought that up because this time of year, when the heating season starts up, this is when we're really starting to kind of add that little piece into the th list of things that we're thinking about in terms of diagnosis. And anytime anybody has any sort of flame anywhere in the house, that can be a furnace, that can be a, a, an oil uh, furnace, a gas furnace. Uh, it can be anything um, that, that's got an open flame in the house. That can be a source of carbon monoxide poisoning. And any time, you know, I guess my point would be headaches should never be contagious. So when everybody in the house all of a sudden has a headache at the same time and everybody has this kind of icky flu-like feeling all at the same time, ding, 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 we're really worried about carbon monoxide poisoning. I, before we started taping, I actually mentioned that happened to my mom and my sister too. One had was feeling symptoms, and then she discovered my mom also had it, and they found out it was something with the, the furnace. First time turning it on that year. And the most important thing when that happens is get out. Second most important thing is we need to get you on some high flow oxygen, supplemental oxygen, which is a capability that we have here in the urgency room. And the third thing you need to know is what your level is mm -hmm. to see how dangerous it is. And, and that's something that we have the capability to test here in the urgency room that is typically not able to be done in a clinic. And uh, how do you test for it? Uh, we have a, a, a probe that we can actually put on your finger that's a, a coximeter probe that can actually measure that directly. And um, it's important to get treatment fast. Absolutely. Yeah. And we see way too many cases like that here in the upper Midwest and in Minnesota as well. Yeah, really sad, tragic things that can happen. Yeah. So you also treat um, children, pediatrics here, as well as adults, and um, you treat them for sometimes for head injuries and things. How does it differ between a, a child and an adult, I'm the so, treatment? I'm so glad that you asked that because the way that we think about uh, working up uh, a child with head injury and, and an adult is very, very, very different. So with children, the minute parents hear that kind of sickening crack sound when the, mm. that <laughs> hits the ground, their heart goes up in their throat and, and, and they are in panic mom and dad mode. And they show up and they want to know, is my kid going to be okay? Mm -hmm. And one of the f important things to kind of think about with that, and one of the very first things they kind of say is, oh my gosh, I need to have a CAD scan. And so uh, we certainly have that capability here in the urgency room. And certainly we do that from time to time, but one of the things that we try to get parents to think about is we're glad that you brought them here because it's very important that children that have had a head injury get seen by someone who is used to seeing children with head injuries. There's certain touchstones of the physical examination, looking at the back of the, of the retina to look for swelling of what we call the back of the eye or the fundus, looking to see if there's any f blood or fluid collecting behind the eardrums. It could be a sign of basal or skull fracture. Being able to feel the skull to make sure that they don't, you don't feel a step off or anything wow. that could be a depressed skull fracture. And one of the questions you may have is then why don't we just for safety scan everybody? And the reason is because in children who have developing brains and they have uh, uh, brain, well, developing brains, um, um, any rapidly dividing cell like that, if it gets exposed to ionizing or x-ray radiation has the possibility of having mutation, which we now know is the basis of tumor and possibly cancer. We also know that with a one-year-old child that receives a single head CT, that their odds of having a tumor in their brain at oh. some time decades later is about one in 1,000. Oh that gosh, drops, to one in, drops to one in 5,000 by the time that child is 10 years old. And by the time that person is an old person, and in radiographic years, old means over 30, it really <laughs> uh, the, the risk then 
drops off exponentially. And so as a result of that, an individual who say, let's say we have grandma or grandpa who are 60 or 70 years old and they're on a blood thinning medication, you know, like warfarin, or they're on aspirin right. and they've hit their head. What we know is that their brains tend to atrophy and shrink over time and that, the, and that the veins and vessels that are bridging parts of the brain actually can be under some tension. And there's a little bit of room inside, inside of there. So when they hit their head, they can actually have some bleeding that goes on possibly for some period of time before they really show symptoms. A child, conversely, they're packed in that skull pretty tightly. And so, um, and what we know is that head bleeds are actually very rare for children. And they're very common for older adults, especially those that are on. And those then just medicines. briefly, how does the CT scan help you in diagnosis and treatment of uh, the young and the and the adults? The important first thing to know about the CT scan is the limitations of what it can and cannot tell you. What it can tell us is if there's a skull fracture, if there's blood within the brain, or if there's edema or swelling within the brain. What it cannot tell us is if there's concussion, because mm -hmm. concussion is actually a clinical diagnosis. Uh, concussion is actually, there's no anatomic feature. By its definition, there's no anatomic feature that tells us it's there. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a physiologic thing. It's, in other words, it's a constellation of symptoms. Fatigue, headache, a little bit of lethargy, lassitude, inability to concentrate, uh, irritability with loud noises. And what we know is that people that have had head injuries, a certain number of them will go on to have concussions, and an even smaller number will go on to have post-concussive syndrome where they have those symptoms for an extended period of time longer than is expected. Um, what we don't know is who's going to be who because it turns out that the incidence of post-concussive syndrome as well as concussion is not necessarily related to the severity of the head injury. Interesting. So it's just time will tell. Exactly Perhaps right. and they need to be seen as soon as they have something like that to rule out other things. Other they, need a, they need a skilled set of medical eyes to take a look at them and then they need to have uh, a clear-eyed view of the risks and benefits of getting the CAT scan versus not getting the CAT scan and making sure that family members are involved in shared decision-making to make that decision. And then if the decision is made, if the decision is made to just watch that patient, um, we educate the parents and the family members as to what to look for and, uh, so that they don't have to worry and they'll know what to do if they see certain symptoms coming up, like vomiting that comes late, confusion that comes late, uh, or lassitude that comes late, that they then bring that person immediately back to us or to an emergency department. And as we heard with um, Dr. Anderson, you can handle a lot of different cases here, a variety of cases, whether it's a head injury or it's, you know, CO poisoning and things like that. And we're really proud of that because we, we kind of, I mean, as emergency physicians, one of the things that we kind of struggled with was people, our friends and families that didn't want to go to the emergency department, and they'd say, oh my gosh, I had this head injury happen and I, felt like I need to go to the emergency department, but I didn't want to wait so long. And so what urgent care would you have me go to? And my answer was none of them because it hadn't been built yet. So we are very proud of this facility because it has the CT scanner. It has the ability to give IV medicines. It has the ability to diagnose some of these serious conditions and stabilize them. Uh, and it's all in one place. All right. Well, Dr. Tim Johnson, it's been a pleasure to have you with us. And thank you for great information for Thanks. our patients. Thanks for coming. And our viewers. Thank you. Take a good look at yourself. Oh, yeah. And turn. Oh, very nice. Check that smooth backside one more time. No, really, check it. Do you see any changing or suspicious spots? It's your skin, and it's important. If you're a man over 50, you're in the group most likely to develop skin cancer, including melanoma, the cancer that kills one person every hour. When detected early, skin cancer is highly treatable. Check yourself out. And find someone else to help. Learn more about what to look for at spotskincancer.org. A message from the American Academy of Dermatology.
And we're back with Dr. Rob Anderson in the urgency room in Venice Heights, the assistant medical director here. Thank you. Thank you. We're in a room with some equipment, and mm -hmm. you have a lot of high quality, high tech equipment here mm -hmm. at the urgency room from ultrasounds, the newest ultrasounds, mm -hmm. to x rays, to this mini C arm. Yep. And That's we're right. going to talk about this in just a second, but um, I think people are familiar with ultrasounds for pregnancies. How, mm -hmm. how else do you use those here in the urgency room? Well, Jody, that's a great point. Most people do commonly associate the ultrasound with pregnancy and, and seeing the baby grow and move. And we have an ultrasound here and we're able to look at the baby in the very early stages of life to make sure that the baby is in the uterus and, and that there's no bleeding around uh, the baby. Uh, but we also use ultrasound on a daily basis to detect if somebody has a blood clot in their leg, to look at their gallbladder to see if it's infected. In our pediatric population, we really try to minimize the amount of radiation that they undergo. So we use an ultrasound to determine if they have appendicitis or not. So there's no ultrasound, there's no radiation with the ultrasound, but there is with X-rays. And that's correct. And the newer X-rays give off less radiation. Yeah, what I mean the, that's what a, are the risk? That's the goal: is to expose a patient to the least amount of radiation as possible, which is why we have the ultrasound. But we also have X-rays if needed. Commonly, X-rays will be ordered if somebody thinks that you know they fell on their arm and they think they might have a broken arm or a broken and leg. We also use x-ray to look at the lungs. So that's how we determine if somebody has pneumonia or a collapsed lung. Uh, we use x-rays for that. Sometimes even for foreign bodies, if somebody thinks that they have a piece of metal in their arm or something like that, we're able to use the x-ray to determine if they have that. And this is something you might not ne necessarily see at some of the retail <coughs> care places Correct. that we see. Yeah. You know, Jody, I had a patient the other day who went to a local walk-in retail clinic and, you know, they had fallen on their hand and they hurt their hand really badly here. So they went there and they said, well, it might be broken, you should go to an urgent care. Then they went to that urgent care and they said, I think it's broken and, and they actually were able to do oh an yeah. x-ray there. And they found out that it was broken, but the bone was out of alignment significantly. So they had to come here to the urgency room and we we're actually able to use a local numbing medicine to numb up that broken bone so it didn't hurt and we put that bone back in place. All right here at one spot here. Yeah. And then what is this C-arm? What is this all about and how do you use this? Well, the C-arm is a, essentially a portable mini x-ray machine. So for a patient who falls out on the arm and breaks their, their, their distal uh, bone in their wrist here, we use this commonly to help put that bone back in place and while we're actually putting it back in place, we use this to determine if it's in good alignment or not. And that differs from the x-rays and things? Correct. So the x-ray is just, you go, you get an x-ray. This actually has live streaming of the x-ray while we're putting the bone back in place to make sure that we're getting it back in proper alignment right exactly where we want it to be. And I don't think people think of this type of high-tech equipment being on location at an urgency room and not at a hospital or other That's facility? Correct. So the C-arm, you're going to find this in an orthopedic office. You'll find it in a local emergency department. But this is not a piece of equipment that you're going to find typically in an urgent care. But here at the urgency room, we do have this. So you don't have to go to a walk-in retail clinic to an urgent care. If you come directly here, we can get the basic x-ray to determine that if you have a fracture or not. And if it's broken and out of alignment, we can use this to help put that bone back in place. And it sounds like it makes it more efficient, more uh, faster Absolutely. and everything like that. What other advantages do you have to having this on-site equipment? Well, and patients don't have to go to the emergency department if we're able to take care of it here. <laughs> yeah. That's sweet and quick. Yeah. So if someone wants more information about the urgency mm -hmm. room, where can they find that information? Well, if you go to urgencyroom.com, you can go on there and you can get information about all three of our locations in Vadnais Heights, Woodbury, and Egan. And actually, if you go online, you can determine, you can see what our wait time is, too. On average, you can see it's much quicker than waiting in an emergency department. Well, it's been a pleasure to talk with you, and thank, thank you, you for taking time out to be with us. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Texting and driving is a deadly combination. Accidents involving distracted drivers are now claiming the lives of more than 3,000 people in the United States. The Minnesota State Patrol hopes that this next video about a deadly accident that claimed the life of a young mom will make you think twice before you pick up the phone while driving during the holiday season. We were the perfect match. We were soulmates. She loved her family more than anything. We'll miss her forever. It should never have happened. I can still see her laying on the side of that road. This is going to follow me for the rest of my life. 
It's tough. It's tough. I made a mistake that day that I can never take back. It's lonely. Very lonely. I remember the day of the crash, it was June 30th and uh, Andrea had the day off um, and was going to spend it with our girls that day. I was in one of our grain bins and uh, um, all of a sudden my mom called on the two-way and said, Matt, where are you at? And I could hear it on her voice that something was uh, uh, very wrong because mom said the Andrea and the girls were in an accident and I knew they were on the bike so I knew it wasn't going to be good. We went out to the crash site. It was difficult. I could see they were uh, doing CPR on Andrea. Uh, I was kind of collecting my thoughts and saying some prayers, and then uh, the fire chief came and said that uh, that we had lost Andrea, and uh, it was tough. And the shock started. Uh, and then I remember the phone call uh, coming in um, and saying that I had to get to the hospital. My little Claire, who was four at the time, was not okay. She had uh, five broken ribs and a punctured lung and uh, some um, crack vertebrae in her neck. And uh, she was intubated to see that little girl with the tubes and uh, everything. is just something no father should ever have to go through to see the fear in your four-year-old's eyes and the quivering of her lip just is, is beyond anything that anyone should have to go through. I think she knew mom was gone, but yet, as a father, you still had to tell her her mom was gone. That day when Andrew was riding her bike, she was doing everything right. But Chris that day was doing something unsafe. He was looking at his phone and ultimately hit my girls, and it, uh, it hurts. I don't know what I was doing for that second where I did not see her. Besides, I knew I was on my phone. I remembered that I had to make a payment on a loan, and I thought, oh, what better time to do it now? If I forget, um, I won't remember to do it later. And so I decided to pick up my phone and started dialing. Next thing I knew is I heard a thud. I don't know if I looked down on my phone for a split second, and I heard a thud. And I looked up in my rearview mirror, and I saw a bicycle. And I knew right away it wasn't good. I never saw her one time. I stopped the vehicle as quick as I could. I started running back towards the bicycle. 911, where's your emergency? There's a girl in the bed. I think they hit by a car. We need to not see, like, you need the ambulance? They're not breathing good at all. We need an ambulance or something really fast. He's not breathing. My, uh, my thoughts were, uh, what the hell have I done? How did I, how did I not see her? No doubt in my mind, it was my fault. I was on the phone. I was driving. I was in control. It was my fault. Mr. Weber, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can will be used against you in court. You have the right to talk to a lawyer and have a lawyer present now or any time during questioning. Were you a driver involved in this collision? Yes, I was. The military has taught me one thing, is honesty, integrity. That's who I am. It was my fault. So it's fair to say you were looking at your cell phone? Yes, it, it would be fair to say it could be. I don't remember being looking at myself. I remember being on my cell phone when it happened. Did you have time to apply your brakes? Um, no, I did not have time. I, I didn't even see the gal. I don't like to fail. That day I felt like I failed. I failed number one because I was on my phone. I was distracted that day. Number two, I failed because I could, couldn't keep her alive. We miss her. The hugs, the touches, the smile, the 
laughs. She loved her family more than anything. She loved her kids. She'd do anything for her kids. In fact, uh, Andrea's last uh, night here, she slept with Claire all night. She was just taking care of Claire one last time. Um, Andrea and I were going to, uh, we wanted more kids. We even talked about adopting someday. But those dreams were shattered. We were the perfect match. We were soulmates and it's just hard going on without her and waking up every morning to, uh, to an empty home and an empty bed just because there's just one person missing. I like before this crash, um, 26 year old, <laughs> loving life. Um, got two kids, then I made that bad choice. Pick up my cell phone that day, make that call. And that choice that I can't take back. And it killed somebody because of that. When I learned Chris was on his phone, it didn't surprise me. I knew the person responsible for Andrea's crash was on her phone even before I was told. I'm thankful that I've got my girls because the day of the crash, they were involved in it and it could have been a lot different. I could have lost everything. I'm terribly sorry for, for what I did that day. My actions can't be changed and I feel terrible that I made that bad choice. It does, it does make it easier that he's taking responsibility for it. But it still doesn't bring Andrea back. And I know that's what he would want, and I know that's what I'd want. It's what we'd all want. Um, that's why we gotta get the word out there. This doesn't need to happen to anyone ever again. He made a mistake, a mistake in his life that he's gonna have to live with for the rest of his life, just as we are gonna have to go on with our life without Andrea, without my wife, the love of my wife, um, the role model to her two girls. What I ask for everybody to do is think about when you pick up your cell phone in your vehicle, is that cell phone worth more than somebody's life next to you? Everybody's got to change their habits. Phones are a habit. They're a bad habit, especially when you're behind the wheel. Yeah, they make life easier, but they made life tougher for us. There's no uh, text or phone call that is that important. I still think it's a big dream, but every morning when I wake up, she's still not here. So put the phone away. We're pretty good butterfly watchers now. Anytime we're seeing a butterfly, whether it be me or Claire, butterflies remind me of, of mom and that mommy is sending these butterflies from, uh, from heaven for us to see. And uh, we stop and take a moment and, uh, and just watch the butterflies. We miss her forever. We'll miss her forever. Please be safe, everyone, this holiday season. Thank you for joining us. We hope you join us next time on Inside Healthcare. See you then.